Hey, everybody. Welcome to a brand new format of the Muscle Intelligence Podcast. I'm your host, Ben Pekulski. We know how valuable your time is. Sometimes it's not possible to get to all your favorite podcasts and listen from the beginning to the end. So what we've done is we've decided to create a brand new format that allows you to get all of the high impact habits, all of the most valuable information in just a short, condensed amount of time. And ultimately, when you hear this podcast, and you know how much you love this information, you have the opportunity then to go back and listen to the entire conversation with the guest. So I hope you love it. Uh, if you do love it, I would love to love it if you would subscribe to the Muscle Intelligence Podcast, share this podcast with at least one person you know and love as we continue to spread this message of intelligent muscle building and ultimately using muscle building and intelligent movement to live to a ripe old age and extend our lifespan. So without further ado for me, enjoy the Muscle Intelligence Podcast. We always say the mitochondria call the shots. <laughs> so even in the context of things like cancer, when the mitochondria become damaged, ATP levels fall. And then through a retrograde response, that basically cell tells the nucleus that there's an energetic crisis. And that begins to cascade to, nor to transform a normal cell into a cancer cell, which upregulates things like glycolysis and sugar metabolism. And that's, you know, eventually the, the transformed cell has a what we call a Warburg phenotype, which is damaged mitochondrial respiration and compensatory fermentation. So the cells ferment and they're, they're using fermenting fuels like glucose and glutamine for their survival. A similar thing is happening, happening in a very protracted way in the context of the space environment or even an undersea environment where there's a higher concentration of oxygen and even a higher concentration of CO2. The partial pressure of CO2 in International Space Station is similar to a submarine where it's like two to 8,000 parts per million of CO2, and this is causing redox stress. So this is something that we study in the lab, how it affects you know, neural control, how it affects brain function, physical function, the gut microbiome, our gut permeability, this high CO2 tends to damage the tight, what are called the tight junctions in the gut. Mm. And that makes the gut leaky. We have the same tight junctions on the blood brain barrier. So it also makes the brain kind of leaky and contributes to inflammation. The countermeasures that are being developed, much like many military projects, those technologies can be applied to the everyday person. Right. So yep. for for not only performance enhancement, but just general health. You said there's there's like a Warburg phenotype. Was it a phenotype or like an expression, I guess? More than 10 years ago now, we started doing research on cancer metabolism. Yep. And we're basically under the impression after observing cancer cell mitochondria in different microscopy setups that the cancer cell mitochondria were spitting out massive amounts of oxygen-free radicals, superoxide, right? I didn't know why this was happening because I didn't know a whole lot about cancer at the time, but come to find out that the metabolism of cancer is significantly different than the metabolism of healthy cells. Whereas a cancer cell metabolism essentially de-differentiates from deriving the majority of its energy from mitochondrial oxidative phosphorylation you know, the electron transport chain, there's a gradual progression of decreased mitochondrial function and mitochondrial number to relying more on glycolytic glutaminolysis metabolism, where you're deriving energy from glucose. So cancer cells in many ways have especially more aggressive tumors that are metastasizing and growing very fast. They have super high rates of glucose metabolism, 100 to 200 times higher. And as a consequence of that, we can image cancer tumors with a fluorodeoxyglucose PET scan or FTG PET scan. So the tumor lights up very intensely. And what you're imaging there is a hyper absorption and metabolism of glucose relative to driven by glycolysis relative to mitochondrial function which in mitochondria use fatty acids and ketones for fuel. So that's sort of falls into this idea that is true to some extent is that if you're in a state of low glucose consumption, low glucose, low blood glucose, low insulin, low IGF-1, uh, which would be facilitated with a ketogenic diet, 
and high fatty acid oxidation, high ketones, that would basically marginalize the growth and development of the tumor. So going off a bit of a tangent, but the Warburg effect, a simple, if I had to have a one sentence description of the Warburg phenotype, it would be damaged mitochondrial respiration leads to compensatory fermentation. How do we counteract these? Obviously, there, there's other things that you're looking for countermeasures for, but specific to the Warburg phenotype, countermeasures, obviously starting with ketogenic diet, but I'd love to hear what other things you guys are exploring. Caloric restriction and ketogenic diet and diets that restrict fermentable fuels will decrease, will take the foot off the gas pedal, so to speak, of cancer growth. So it'll slow it down. It will not cure cancer. I don't care what anybody says. Some, some people look at different animal studies and, and say and think that different dietary patterns, whether it be the Budwig diet or the vegan diet or this diet, it would be the cure for cancer. And that's not the case. But these nutritional therapies, and that's what they are, medical therapies, can, can be used as a standalone therapy, you know, if cancer has been very advanced or if standard care is not working. But we're very interested in using a modified ketogenic diet that I call like a protein sparing modified ketogenic diet that's supplemented. <laughs> So it's a ketogenic diet that has higher amounts of protein to mitigate cancer cachexia. It's modified with the types of fatty acids that comprise. A ketogenic diet is much higher percentage-wise in fat. So we want to use you know, omega-3 fatty acids, less omega-6s. We want to use medium chain triglycerides because they're more ketogenic. And we also want to incorporate different types of prebiotic fiber into the ketogenic diet to preserve and sustain the gut microbiome because that's really important for barrier function in the gut. It also makes uh, short chain fatty acids like butyrate, which can be important. So you have higher protein, almost double the amount of protein. A clinical ketogenic diet for epilepsy is like 10% protein. So we want to boost that up to 20, even upwards to 25, 30. And then a fatty acid composition that's not only highly anti-inflammatory, but also very ketogenic, like uh, caprylic triglyceride, for example, it's rich in that. And then prebiotic fiber that can preserve and, and maintain the gut microbiome. Is that a supplemental source, Dom, or is that from a specific food for the prebiotic fibers? Uh, yeah, it could be a mix of different plant-based, you know, phytonutrients. There's different fibers on, on the market, obviously, like different prebiotic fibers, but or they could be plant-based from like artichoke or greens or something like that. You know, in our lab setting, we have to rely on whatever the company has <laughs> For different fermentable fuels. So we usually use a common, like some soluble and insoluble fiber mix. But when you're formulating like a diet for someone, you want to have a diversity, mostly like things that are very, like greens. So very dark greens, dark leafy greens, you know, broccoli, of course, is good, uh, asparagus, things like that, things that are just mostly water and fiber. But then a lot of, a big part of what we do is actually developing ketone supplements that do two things really. They elevate ketones in the blood and ketones have, you know, they provide energy to healthy cells, but not so much cancer cells. They have epigenetic effects. They have anti-inflammatory signaling effects. They preserve and can protect the brain from radiation if someone's undergoing like radiation therapy for a brain tumor. And they have anti-catabolic effects. So uh, we've published on this showing that and that may be like from an evolutionary perspective, when you're fasting, you start mobilizing fatty acids for fuel. The fats do not cross the blood brain barrier. So the liver converts the fats to ketones. And then the ketones can preserve your CNS function. And many people become more lucid, like in a fasted state. And then the ketone bodies actually prevent the breakdown of skeletal muscle. They actually have anti-catabolic effects. So if we're fasting, if we, we did not make ketones, first of all, we would not have brain energy. <laughs> Our brain energy would, would tank, right? But the beta-hydroxybutyrate and acetoacetate prevent alanine from breaking down. A major gluconeogenic amino acid in skeletal muscle is alanine. So we'll start breaking down skeletal muscle to liberate gluconeogenic amino acids to preserve our normal, there's very powerful homeostatic mechanisms that maintain blood glucose. And part of that process is breaking down skeletal muscle to get access to it. But if ketones are elevated, 
then that has a tremendous anti-catabolic effect by virtue of preventing uh, the breakdown of skeletal muscle. How often and when are you using ketone supplements now, Dom? This morning, like when I wake up, I'll take third of a packet of Keto Start, which is like by Audacious Nutrition. It's like really concentrated electrolyte. Ketone salts, but, right? Yeah, yeah. And the salt blend, most ketone salts on the market basically just give me diarrhea. <laughs> it's really bad. Like pretty yeah. much all of them do. There's a formulation that there's a product that I really like called Element. Rob Wolf makes it. It's like yep. electrolyte. Yep. So the Keto Star uses the that ratio of electrolytes, but it binds beta hydroxybutyrate to the electrolytes. So you're giving the electrolytes, and then you're giving you know ketones at the same time. Uh, so I'll take I'll do a third of the packet in the morning with like creatine and acetyl L-carnitine. So I'll mix that together. And then I drink that and just with water. So it's really no calories. And then I go out like this morning, I let the cows out. I walk around barefoot. I get a lot of bright sun as the sun's coming up. And then I jump in the pool and swim a couple laps. And then I come in start brewing my coffee and getting my workstation, getting things up, <laughs> up and running. So that's like my normal routine. And then I'll take the rest of the packet around like two o'clock in the afternoon. And then I'll mix that up and then it'll just give me a second, a second wind. If I'm hiking or doing like extreme stuff, when I lived in the undersea environment for 10 days underwater, I was consuming a lot of exogenous ketones and looking at the effects on oxidative markers and things like that. So yeah, I'm a big fan of, you know, I have, I have a whole bunch of <laughs> ketones around the office behind me. So we have like probably... 30 or more molecules. I mean, most of my research has been on ketone esters, but then as I progressed, then I realized that I was kind of not very favorable from you know, taking a big load of sodium. And then I realized that sodium is actually like one of, like a performance enhancing substance. And I kind of load on sodium before I go train, especially in Florida. So the ketone salt is actually perfect because I'm getting my electrolytes like element, but delivering beta hydroxybutyrate, which is like really a nootropic. So I think of, I experiment with a lot of different nootropics and I find that beta hydroxybutyrate is probably up there with the top. And you're, it's not a stimulant, although. If you use like keto start that has caffeine in it, then there's a, a definitely a synergy between ketones and caffeine that have been you know studied and reported on. So that's something that I use also if I'm writing and I just need a lot of cognitive you know energy. Not really a difference in efficacy with the salts versus the esters. Well, with the esters, you have to be sort of careful because uh, esters are more potent, and we're using them in some of our. It depends on the context of what you're using it for. So, an ester will boost your ketones above two millimolar, up to three and four. What happens when you boost your ketone levels to two millimolar is that you start pumping out insulin. Mm. So, and then that's how we actually regulate ketones. When we go on a ketogenic diet, our ketones become elevated and then we pee out ketones. That's called ketonuria. And then as the ketones get elevated, the ketones will then stimulate the pancreas to release a little bit of insulin. And that decreases fat oxidation in the liver, beta oxidation of fatty acids in the liver. So, you know, that the insulin, as Ben Bickman <laughs> talked about, the insulin will shut off the fat burning process, which is not good if you're using ketones for recomp. If you're consuming ketone esters and getting above two millimolar, then you're shutting off your fat burning process as evidenced by the decrease in ketones production. So if so, the bottom line is that if you take a ketone supplement and you're shooting above two millimolar, maybe even 1.5, then you're decreasing fatty acid oxidation by virtue of releasing insulin and you're also decreasing ketone production. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you have enjoyed today's high impact summary. If you want to go deeper into any of the content you just heard, don't forget to check out the full length show that was just released. You can head over to muscleintelligence.com slash podcast to check out that in all of our podcasts. If you want to subscribe so you never miss a podcast, head over to your favorite podcast platform, whether it be Spotify, Apple, YouTube, any of the amazing places where a great podcasts to listen to, you can head over there and subscribe. If you want to join our email list to get free information where I'm constantly providing value, I'm constantly providing insights into the information learned on these podcasts, you can head over to muscleintelligence.com slash learn 
to grab a free guide on ultimately living your greatest life. Thank you for being here. And as always, live your greatest life in a body that you absolutely love. Thank you so much for tuning into Muscle Intelligence. If you enjoyed today's episode, please be sure to share it with at least one person you know. Make sure you're subscribed so you never miss an episode. This podcast is for information purposes only. The statements and views on this podcast are not medical advice. This podcast, including Ben Bikulski and the producers, disclaim responsibility for any possible adverse effects from the use of information contained herein. Opinions of guests are their own, and this podcast does not endorse or accept responsibility for statements made by guests. This podcast does not make any representations or warranties about guest qualifications or credibility. This podcast may contain paid endorsements or advertisements for products or services. Individuals on this podcast may have a direct or indirect financial interest and products or services referred to herein. If you think you have a medical problem, consult a licensed physician.